Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on October 13th, 2024. And the first thematic Old Testament reading is Amos 5, verses 6 through 7 and 10 through 15. The first reading in the semi-continuous series is Job 23, verses 1 through 9 and 16 through 17. We'll talk about Psalm 90, verses 12 through 17. We'll talk about Hebrews 4, 12 through 16, and the gospel reading Mark 10, verses 17 through 31. That easy, pleasant, so easy, so delightfully preachable story of Jesus and the rich man and camels and eyes of needles and who then can be saved. This yeah. is not, Jesus and Mark doesn't talk much at all in the first seven and a half chapters. And then people are like, how come he doesn't talk? And then he starts talking and everybody's like, I wish he would say less. Less. <laughs> <laughs> this is really hard. Well, and as we talked about last week, it's a lot of talking, a lot of hard things, right? When they're entering, mm -hmm. about to enter Jerusalem. <laughs> so, exactly. You know, you kind of wish there had been a little bit more pacing uh, <laughs> with the hard things, you know, say a couple hard things, do some healings, then a hard thing, then do some. But but I point that out, not not to wish for a different narrative, but but it does, it 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 does have a narrative effect of, of moving through chapter 10 with one thing after another of, of some challenging words from Jesus or harder words from Jesus that, that really do, that I think that really do narratively emphasize where we're going and what's at stake um, coming up with um, chapter 11 and the entry into Jerusalem. Because once that happens, then of course the ball starts rolling. And no so, uh, yeah, right. And so it, it it I find that really interesting that you have some of these really challenging uh, challenging words from Jesus right at this precipice, uh, and and what and it and it kind of makes you get at the edge of your seat a little bit more and say, "Wow, why are you talking about this here? What difference does it make now? Uh, how how do I hear how do I hear these words differently? I mean, they don't necessarily know what's coming, but you know what I mean. It just it 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 for me it heightens it, and 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 especially I, in some ways with this section of chapter ten, looking forward in verse twenty eight, Peter began to say to him, "Look, we have left everything and followed you." And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there's no one who has left house or brothers. Okay. So we have left everything and followed you. Then go back to verse 22, that this man will have to uh, leave everything as well. So it puts the, it, it puts the possessions, if you will, in a particular framework of, of, and here it's mothers, sisters, you know, brothers, sisters, mother or father, children, fields for the sake of the good news. And so for me, it asks that question, okay, what, what exactly are those possessions uh, that, uh, that, that you're going to be asked to leave behind? It's not asking of any one anything differently than at, that has been asked of every one. Um, our possessions just may be different. And uh, Matt, before you drop your wisdom, let me tell a story from um, my uh, first appointment uh, out of seminary. Um, it was uh, in um, uh, a first church, and I say it that way to put all of the uh, stereotypes of being appointed to first church uh, in uh, the city center uh, uh, after in Michigan, after having been raised on the south side of Chicago, going to Garrett, reading Jim Cohn, and uh, taking seriously this whole idea of um, what what does it mean um, to to attend to those who have possessions. And um, 
what I learned in that church was that God cared for them. And um, this idea that where I thought literally the rich can't enter into heaven because you can't thread it you know, thread a needle with a, ca- a camel. Um, and what Jesus taught me there was, uh, what God taught me there was that Jesus loves the rich too. And we need some folks to, you know, to pay for the world we live in. Um, but we've been talking about how we kick people out. And that was who I was willing to kick out. And I thought I could use a text to do that. Rich people can't be, and yet it's not that. It's a question of who am I making it possible for them to find the grace of God? And Caroline, I think your introduction to this is exactly, you know, what God, what what Jesus is asking of this man is no less than what he has asked of the disciples. They just happen to be in different economic categories. Yeah, once again, this is all into the canopy of what does it mean to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow. And the the call to this man is also a call to follow that Caroline mentioned. Uh, Jesus loves this man. That's undeniable because the text makes that pretty plain. And it's, you know, the commentary uh, this week talks about all the ways in which the the parable springs, or the story springs a trap on us. I've written about this in the past. It talks about some of the history of its interpretation. And so at the end of the day, it's finally, I think you just preach it. You just retell it. Mm -hmm. And you acknowledge that in some ways it sounds and looks extreme and taken to its logical extension, creates a really weird world (laughs) economically. Mm -hmm. But again, the point of this is not get rid of your money because your money is corrupting you or killing you. The point of the story is, Give away your money and give it to the poor. Give away your possessions right. and give it to the poor. It's about empowering others and pulling others out of vulnerability. So we don't want to miss that, right? We sometimes take this as, you know, there's a certain number in your bank account. And if you're higher than that, you're not getting into the kingdom or something like that. It's not what this is about. So I would say also, again, this that final dialogue uh, with Peter and, and Jesus I think is beautiful. I think it's a way of Jesus talking about um, the kind of new community he's creating Mm -hmm. is one in which the difference between this rich man and quote unquote, the poor, let's just say those who suffer in poverty is about more than just how much stuff they've got. It's what they dwell in worlds that just don't intersect, especially in, in in ancient society, I'd say still in ours too. And so what does it mean to create that sense of, I don't know if it's the right word, solidarity sometimes has gotten watered down, but a kind of identity um, with, with others that's not where, where influence status, power, whatever word you want to use falls away and creates this new kind of community where everybody is sharing something and, it's in, and the family um, imagery is part of that. So to, yeah, before we get caught up in the finances of this, right. to get a sense of the vision that Jesus is trying to promote on the, on the, um, at the end of it. And that's, that's where that line, you know, in verse 29, uh, for my sake or for the sake of the good news. I mean, this is, that's, that I think for me ties back to the, the reminder that you said, Matt, about, and give money to the poor. I mean, it's not, it, it's not walking away from all these things for, because, because of, uh, because of a, a rejection of Riches. riches. It, it's it's for the sake of something else, and it's for the sake of the kingdom and and the good news of the gospel, and and so that that then becomes, and then you know, verse thirty one. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So that whole that whole that upendedness of <laughs> of where we locate our worth and where we locate our 
our understanding our you know our identity and who we are all of these all of those things are coming into question here and it's not then accidental that you have the it have this story and uh, and the exchange with Peter right before the last passion prediction. So it, it just in case you were wondering what it what is all of this for, uh, it is. And we sometimes forget that in those passion predictions, uh, they are uh, that they are also uh, resurrection predictions, <laughs> and that I will rise again. And so there's something that we're 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 reminded that there's something beyond yeah, what we're being asked to do or what we're being asked to give up or set aside is for something beyond that we can't even also imagine. So it puts all of this too in the mystery and wonder of the resurrection that I think is also an important um, homiletical and theological framework for getting at, um, getting at some of this. And the anticipation uh, of the community that is formed. Uh, uh, th- that was the word I thought about, um, uh, Matt, as you were talking about the solidarity. Um, the results of the resurrection formed a community that um, s- systemically or culturally disrupted the caste and class system that this is contradicting. And... Um, when we realize that that's the direction that this is going into, suddenly these words explain why the first church began to gather across that caste and class system the way that it did. I'm working on a sermon on this text uh, even now, and the the one of the challenges I'm facing is avoiding rescuing people from the text. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because, of course, it's hard to go up there and preach this with a ton of conviction, knowing that I'm going to go home <laughs> to my stuff. Do you know, and, and um, so how it, it's hard to preach a sermon when you're not so sure you're listening yourself. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but it's a text that I think just has a power. And so to let the text do the hard work of just being what it is and saying what it says, I, I have a pastor friend now retired who is always fond of saying that the church will not be in the business of getting between people and their generosity. And a a call like this will trigger something in some people and, and will set them free in ways that you can't necessarily predict. And so it's not our job to change the quote here, right? To get between this text and people. Um, or the, because it's not just the demands of the text. I don't even use that word, right? It's the freedom promised right. yeah. by this text, yeah. the new life promised by this the text. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I opened with that story because as an early preacher, it wasn't me getting in between the text and the people. It was me judging the people as if the text wasn't for them. Yeah. I, I, you know, I was confessing my own inability to believe that God loved these people the way God loved this man. (laughs) Hello, I'm Matt Skinner with a brief interruption in the middle of this podcast. Our fall fundraising campaign has launched and we could really use your help to reach our goal. Since 2007, Working Preacher has operated as a totally free online resource accessible to anyone. There are no paywalls, no registrations, no barriers, no passwords, and no conditions just like the gospel of Jesus Christ itself. And in order to keep Working Preacher that way, we depend on support from donors just like you. Your donations are more than charity. They make you active partners in this ministry. God uses preaching to change lives, and Working Preacher donors like you are essential parts of that spiritual labor. You have until October 31st to make a gift that will count toward the fall campaign. And let me add that we have a special gift for a limited number of monthly donors. If you're one of the first 10 donors to make a recurring gift of $10 per month or more to this ministry, then you'll receive a book by Walter Brueggemann in the Working Preacher Books series titled Preaching Jeremiah, Announcing God's Restorative Passion. I personally am grateful for the generosity of everyone who donates to Working Preacher. Your financial gifts to this ministry are reminders 
that Christ's church is always in action. Thank you. Well, perhaps you were thinking you were Amos. Because um, <laughs> Amos 5, nice. one, of the, one of the unfortunate aspects of this pairing is Amos is Amos is not necessarily castigating the wealthy. He's castigating the wealthy who are oppressive and who, mm-hmm. yes. are, who are playing by the rules that money sets and that wealth accumulation sets. And so I think a, a preacher has to be careful to note that difference too. That this is not yes. Amos saying you have things, therefore you are <laughs> right. this. This right. is Amos talking about the people who trample on the poor, take from them levies of grain. Right. Which, you know, is one way to build wealth, but it's the way in which wealth builders often understand the logic of what that looks like. Not always, but... Sometimes the individual end justifies uh, a means that tramples on the community. And uh, I, I say we ignore this text for our own peril because in many ways this is exactly where we are right now. Um, not, and I want to, I want to stress, uh, sometimes I, I mentioned that scripture is written not to folks outside of the people of God. It's written to the people of God. Amos is speaking to the leaders of Israel and how they are taking their riches and wealth as wealth and trampling the poor. And that becomes acts of injustice. Um, I, I, I think we need to start at home as I did with my own confession. And one of the things, one of the interesting pairings about this text goes back to the comment you made, Matt, and that I was getting it with the passion predictions about it's for the sake of life. Seek the Lord and live. You look at the times that this has been, that this is repeated in this passage, seek the Lord and live. um, And, you know, you shall not live in them, but you know, what, what the Lord what the Lord provides, uh, seek good and not evil that you may live. And so that this is for the sake of, of life, right. Mm-hmm. And in abundance, um, which, which is what God wants for all people. And, um, so how do you, how do you look beyond those, <clears throat> those imme- that immediate request and, or that immediate call and say, you know, living into an imagination of what resurrected life really looks like. Um, that resurrection is more than resurrection is more than the promise of the resurrection of a future. Uh, it is um, the life giving possibilities of God here and now. Mm-hmm. And so, it, I think it also invites an imagination of the resurrection that that makes a difference for people. Great, Job. Oh. This is unfortunately the only passage really from the dialogical parts of the book I mean, among human beings, right? That next week we will jump to God speaking from the whirlwind. But Job's going to take God to court. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Job's or wants been, to take God to court. Job's been through a lot. <laughs> and yes. one of the things that I appreciate about this, uh, again, anticipating the end, you know, that God's um, uh, identified find Job at the beginning proves to be accurate at the end. But here we are in the middle where Job is like, you know, all over himself. I was like, what do I do with this? And what are you doing? And yeah, God answer, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. And there are times when it is just really good to know that God can handle me saying, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And, and that being filled with the accusations against God, that being filled with, I don't get it, God, that being filled with, what do I do? Um, there is, I mean, for all we want to do with this in terms of God and, and, and whether God is good here, and I'll talk about that next week, but in this particular point, it's good news for me that Job can be fully honest with God because he couldn't with his friends. Well, and I think too, um, the, that we invite people into certain passages of scripture, uh, particular that, that 
I don't want to say give permission, but something like that, that say, as you were talking about joy, that, uh, that invite people into, or recognize that God can take it, right? God can, you know, God can take. And I think that's true for the lament Psalms in particular, that, that, that when we get to the lament Psalms, we can, we, we say, you know, there, it's extraordinary that these Psalms are included in scripture that give us language and voice, uh, and it's okay to lament to God. And this is a similar kind of passage that we don't talk about very often, but in the, in the context of what you were saying and how, how do we navigate our relationship with God that, that Job gives us, uh, Job gives us that language of what we're feeling, um, as we are navigating that relationship. And I really, really, I, I would, I would drop, uh, preacher's attention to the commentary uh, with regard to the last section, the twin dangers of the absence and presence of God. I mean, I, I think that's something that is so theologically poignant here that uh, that that God, you know, at the on the one hand we want God's presence, and then on the other hand, what do we do with God's absence? But then. It's okay that God is not around because God's presence is, you know? and so we just. How often do we do we live in that space of wanting God close, and yet, yet when God comes close, there are certain things that are that we might not appreciate about God being so close. <laughs> and so I think that that is really fruitful homiletical direction that could also be taken with this text. Yeah. I think about that with passages like this, or when people talk about, you know, the nearness of God or wondering what God is up to. I think like, you should read the whirlwind speech. (laughs) 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 We might be a little more careful with that. It's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting to read Job's confidence here, his passion here in light of having read the whirlwind speech where you go, yep, he's going to be a little disappointed (laughs) when he finally gets... Do you know what I mean? But it's it sets up what's yet to come in some interesting ways. And this, again, it's a shame there's only this one passage from the, 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 the bulk of the book. But it is a passage that encapsulates pretty well this agony of being human, the agony of feeling like I have been wronged, right? That something fundamentally unfair has happened, something cruel has happened. If anybody with an ounce of reason would hear my case, they would agree with me. I mean, that's that's not just bluster, mm-hmm. um, especially knowing Job's story, but it's just an awful way to live, right? It's that frustration with the ways of the world. And as Caroline brought up last week, you know, we are only doing this for four weeks, but linger with this reality for 40 chapters, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah. and, um, the a point that I I didn't make earlier in in Job's honesty and it's Job's forthcoming is that as Job, knowing he's blameless, comes to God, there is also a sense of still trusting God's goodness. You know, like you said, Matt, if if someone would hear my case, they'd know better. Yeah. Um, so God, you hear my case. Um, and it, can I dare say that's almost like Thomas? You know, we, it's 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 less doubt and more. If if you're here, you'll make this clear. In in this absence, it's not clear. So Job demands, show up, God. And in some ways, that's what Thomas did. I need what you guys had. I'm going to confess something. I don't know what to do with Psalm 90, 12 through 17 this week. I would say sing it. <laughs> or, yeah, or you want to preach your sermon. <laughs> well, I verse think, thirteen. <laughs> verse thirteen, right? Yeah. How long? How long? <laughs> how long? How long? How, how long? long? Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, it. There is this. There is this promise of, um, uh, you know, of of God's of God's favor, and then then also the that. Yeah, that how long? So maybe something like that. But I'm with you, Matt. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, Hebrews. Yeah, if people don't believe um, Hebrews four verses twelve through thirteen, they haven't heard the gospel reading yet. Mm. 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 
Yeah. Good in terms point. of, yeah, the, the ability of, of, of a word from the Lord to speak um, to our conscience and to expose the things in us we wish were not exposed. Well, and, you know, verse... Uh, verse 16, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I mean, I think there, this particular, you know, 14 through 16, if, if, if people know anything from Hebrews, it's typically these verses, it's, this is one passage is where, one. where they, oh yeah, I think I've heard that before. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. And so let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. I mean, I, I, I definitely think that you could weave some of that confidence of the, of the author of Hebrews into some of the things that we've already talked about in terms of approaching God in, in boldness with, with what, with what we have, what the case we have for God, or what is it that we're bringing to God? And that's, and that part of the, part of the working Christology here is that that's possible in part because of Jesus. Uh, and so um, it's a, that's an interesting way to get at it, to get at, a sermon on Christology to think that that's, that's in part what Jesus means, right? Um, a kind of, a kind of relationship with God that, that makes possible, um, these, these kinds of moments with God. And having lifted Jesus up as above, um, you know, d- d- you know, above the angels, above, uh, the, the, the great high priest, uh, above Moses, um, above the prophets, um, that here Jesus identifies with us, which in itself becomes an invitation for us not to rebel or reject um, as our ancestors, if we you know, take um, uh, those who have come before us in faith have done, but to uh, trust the Spirit's work in us that we, like Jesus, can be tested and not sin. And there's a way in which that's what we're reading in Job, is that Job was tested and didn't sin. And so it is possible in that story to see that in this story, we, like Jesus, can be tested and not sin. And Jesus, the perfect human, has demonstrated that for us. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.